So today we are three speakers, myself, Aditya Reddy and Jayalakshmi. We are covering select definitions under the CGST Act. So the topics that I will be covering today are basic interpretative clauses, adjudicating authority, taxable territory, goods and services, classification of goods and classification of services. So the With regard to the interpretation clauses in modern statutes, there are three types of provisions which are found in the enacting parts of many statutes which constitute the primary internal aids to interpretation of a statute. They are interpretative or definition section, the proviso and the saving. In recent statutes, a set of provisions for interpretation of the terms used in the statute, these usually take two forms stating either that a particular word or phrase means or has the meaning assigned to it or that a particular word or phrase includes in certain instances both are found when the legislature uses the term means and includes when an interpretation section states that the word or phrase means any other meaning is excluded whereas the words included indicates an extension of the ordinary meaning which continues to apply in appropriate cases such interpretative provisions are also qualified usually with the words unless the context otherwise requires the most quoted example of the nature of a definition section is the case of Holtman versus bb tankers this was a case arising under the Employers Liability Defective Equipment Act 1969, which provided that an employer is liable to an employee who suffers personal injury in the course of his employment in consequence of a defect in equipment provided by the employer for the purposes of the employer's business. Section 1, subclause 3 stated that Equipment includes any plant and machinery, vehicle, aircraft, and clothing. A question arose as to whether the Employers Liability Act would apply when a ship crew had drowned because of the ship's sea unworthiness. The Court of Appeal held that since the definition provision specifically provides for vehicles on land, and aircrafts on air, it should be taken to specifically exclude conveyance on the sea in a ship. Reversing such interpretation, it was held that the term includes cannot be construed as means and includes, restricting the scope of the term equipment to the examples given. The section was held to be merely clarificatory that all kinds of plant and machinery were covered. The liability to the crew members of a ship was held to fall within the ambit of the act as the legislative intention was to saddle the employer with all liabilities in every case where an employee is harmed due to defective equipment, he is forced to work within the course of his employment. The first definition which I'll be dealing with today is adjudicating authority. Under section two, Four of the CGST Act, adjudicating authority is defined as any authority appointed or authorized to pass any order or decision under this act, but does not include the Central Board of Indirect Taxes and Customs, the Revisional Authority, the Authority for Advanced Ruling, the Appellate Authority for Advanced Ruling, the Appellate Authority, and the appellate tribunal and the authority referred to in subsection 2 of section 171. Thus, authority is excluded from the definition of adjudicating authority, cannot decide the issue on their own and pass an order related to matters which are not the subject matter of the original adjudicating authority. In other words, the definition of adjudicating authority confirms and crystallizes the various decisions passed by courts and tribunals to the effect that the appellate authorities or courts cannot go beyond the subject matter of the original adjudicating proceedings. 
in this connection i wish to discuss three case laws one by the supreme court and two by our honorable high court the first decision is that of state of kerala versus vijaya stores the facts of that case was that there were certain additions that were made and the adjudicating authority had added 10% to the admitted turnover subsequently the appellate assistant commissioner had reduced an admitted 5% addition to the admitted turnover such enhancement was challenged before the appellate tribunal and in this case no cross objection or appeal was filed by the department the tribunal was of the view that the lower authorities had no reason to enhance any amount less than the specified amount it was held that the tribunal has no jurisdiction or power to enhance the assessment in the absence of an appeal by the department the second case pertains to bistion automotive systems <coughs> this was a case where there were proceedings initiated against the company for proposal to impose a penalty under section 114a of the customs act it was contended before the tribunal that there was no suppression of facts and therefore the suppression and the consequential imposition of penalty under 114a was not justified the tribunal accepted the contention but said that if 114a is not permissible we will impose a penalty under 112a it was contended that it was not permissible for the tribunal to do so as the original authority had not imposed the penalty under 112a and this was not challenged by the department the tribunal did not agree to their contention and the matter was taken up before the high court the high court accepted the appellant's contention and stated that the jurisdictional limitation by the tribunal has not been taken into a proper account and therefore set aside saying that since there was no appeal by the department in that case and since the tribunal is not an adjudicating authority they ought not to have imposed the penalty under section 112a <laughs> there is another possible view in this which arose in the under the sales tax act in the case of state of tamil nadu versus arul murugan and company in that case the full bench of the high court held that in the absence of any statutory inhibitions or restrictions an appellate authority has precisely the same powers exercisable in the same manner and to the same extent as the assessing authority has in the first instance but this case may not have strict application because in that case they held that there was no statutory inhibition or restriction but under the gst act there is a specific definition and therefore this case may not apply is my understanding the next definition which i will be taking on today is on reverse charge <coughs> so reverse charge under gst has got a specific definition under section 298 of the cgst act and without any ambiguity it covers specific provisions of the act under section 93 of the cgst act and section 53 of the igst act reverse charge mechanism is brought into the tax net by enabling the government to issue notification specifying the category of goods and services and the category of recipient on whom such liability is fixed for the purpose of payment of tax in so far as section 94 of cgst act and 54 of igst act the government is required to issue appropriate notification to enable the recipient to pay the tax when purchases are effected from an unregistered seller in reverse charge the dispute over the payment of gst on the part of importer in the case of transportation of goods for importation into india relating to ocean freight has been settled by the honorable gujarat high court in the case of mohit minerals the crux of the case to my understanding is as follows in the case of reverse charge it has to be kept in mind 
that unless the notification issued by the government specifying the category of services or goods and the recipient in each and every case the reverse charge will not apply this is always a misunderstanding on the part of the sse thinking that for every case reverse charge would apply if tax itself is exempted through a notification then reverse charge mechanism will not be relevant as once the tax is exempted no tax is payable under reverse charge mechanism and further rcm is nothing but the mechanism by which the input service receiver by a notification is made to pay the tax in relation to the supplier of service or goods but yet so long as it is an input service charged under the rcm the person paying the tax under the mechanism is always entitled to take credit subject to other restrictions available under the act the next definition that i'll be taking on is taxable territory taxable territory is defined under section 2109 of the cgst act and is a concept that has been brought under gst specifically because under sub section 1 sub section 2 sub clause 2 the act is extended to the whole of india therefore the place where the service is received should be within the taxable territory in other words as a destination oriented tax law it has to take care of the particular point where the service occurs within the taxable territory or not the igst provisions section 10 to section 14 will be relevant normally if the services are received or supplied the place of supply will be where the recipient is located as it is generally presumed that wherever the recipient is located the services will be supplied whereas in specific cases even though the services are received outside or inside india place of supply is based on where the service is performed or where the activity takes place such as clearing and forwarding agency services cargo handling services custom house agent services repairs and maintenance services beauty parlor services etc similarly services relating to immovable property would hinge on where such an immovable property is located and would be a relevant factor for the purpose of determining the place of supply the next definition which i'll be dealing today is on goods and services <clears throat> so far as goods are concerned it is defined under section 252 of the act the law clearly says the goods refers to movable property other than money and securities in so far as goods are concerned though it includes actionable claims by virtue of schedule 3 of the cgst act only actionable claim relating to betting gambling and lottery etc will be taxable all other actionable claims will be treated as neither supply of goods nor supply of services services are defined under section 2102 as anything other than goods <coughs> money and securities with regard to securities an explanation has been introduced by which any facilitation or arrangement of securities will be treated as service falling under the definition of service the definition of goods refers to movable property in so far as immovable property is concerned a clue may be found under section 17 of the cgst act where in the context of input tax credit a distinction is made between immovable property and plant and machinery in other words it appears that the government has expounded that in the case of plant and machinery being embedded into the earth for the purpose of functioning the plant and machinery through a foundation bolt and structural supports etc they will still be considered as plant and machinery other than immovable property 
thus merely because a particular missionary is grounded to the earth it does not become immovable property by virtue of it being embedded to the earth is my view with regard to classification of goods and rates of taxes under gst i wish to say that for classification of goods gst tariff has adopted the tariff description subheading section notes and chapter notes as per the customs tariff and hence rules for interpretation of the first schedule to the customs tariff act 1975 would be relevant the harmonized system nomenclature would be relevant for interpretation of tariff for goods under gst as well as it has high persuasive value for classification for instance the woodcrops case of the supreme court it was held that hsn has high persuasive value the gst tariff for goods and services becomes statutorily relevant for charging such levy further under the gst apart from charging section section 91 under the gst cgst act and section 51 of the igst act there is no separate tariff legislation the task of fixing actual rates of gst has been left to the gst council on whose recommendation the rates of gst on various goods are notified by the government with regard to the classification and rates of tax under gst on the supply of service classification of service under gst is a mixed bag chapter 99 covers services with description which are taxable this is called service accounting code sac the central board of indirect taxes and customs has issued detailed explanatory notes to the scheme of classification regarding the scope of coverage of the heading groups and service codes of the scheme of classification of services these explanatory notes are useful as a guiding tool for classification of service and is based on the united nations central product classification uncpc a small observation about UNCPC is that it constitutes a comprehensive classification of all goods and services. CPC presents categories for all products that can be the object of domestic or international transactions or that can be entered into stocks. It includes products that are an output of economic activity including transportable goods non transportable goods and services cpc was developed to serve as an instrument for assembling and tabulating all kinds of statistics requiring product detail such statistics may cover production intermediate and final consumption capital formation foreign trade or prices one important aspect on the classification of services is separation of job work for manufacturing of goods from the category of manufacture of goods under the central excise tariff as it existed then and bringing the same as service under the service classification so with this i conclude my part of the presentation and i thank each and every one of you for being present here now i request my next speaker mr aditya reddy to take thank you i have unmuted uh, i have yeah, unmuted yeah. you yes good evening everybody um we will start with a simple definition Okay. We will start with a tim, tim, uh, simple definition that of a taxable person. Yeah, a taxable person um, is defined as someone who is registered or is liable to be registered under sections twenty-two and section twenty-four of the GST Act. 
therefore it becomes necessary to look into the to the requirements of section 22 and 24 also basically uh, those two sections lay down the threshold criteria and the compulsory criteria for registration the purpose of the definition is basically to bring within the tax net two kinds of people one is people who have just commenced business or who have just fulfilled the criteria under section 22 and section 24 and the second category of persons who it, which it which it intends to cover are basically people who want to evade tax so uh, the a taxable person who doesn't register himself is dealt with in the following manner to ensure that there is no evasion one he is likely to face a penalty starting from rupees 10000 rupees to as much as the entire tax that is evaded by him under section 122 then he is likely to face best judgment of assessment since he won't be filing his returns being an unregistered person under section 62 and section 63 uh, based on whatever material is available the proper officer will assess him and any person dealing with him will have to face a lot of uh, tax burdens such as denial of itc payment of tax on reverse charge etc next we will move on to two subcategories of taxable persons which are unique to the gst act well, uh, they are uh, basically the concepts of a casual taxable person and a non resident taxable person we will a casual taxable person and a non resident taxable person both are defined as taxable persons who occasionally undertake transactions that constitute supply in the case of a casual taxable person the transactions are occasionally undertaken in a state or union territory where he does of a non resident taxable person he will be undertaking occasional transactions when he doesn't have a fixed place of business in india itself so this is the distinction but the commonality is that both of them will have to undertake transactions occasionally now to deduce what is the meaning of the term occasionally we will be we will have to look into a, the requirement which says that any person either a casual taxable person or a non resident taxable person when he intends to get registration he is eligible for registration only for a maximum period of 90 days so he uh, uh, the moment he crosses business he crosses his transactions beyond the period of 90 days he will become a regular taxpayer and his registration as a casual taxable person and non resident taxable person will be liable for cancellation this 90 day period is extendable by another 90 days solely at the discretion of the proper officer so this is the meaning of the term occasionally though it is not defined separately under the act now uh, there are some common provisions which govern both of them one both of them will have to deposit tax at an esti on an estimate of their tax liability before they get registration when they when they apply for registration they will have to deposit tax on a net on an estimate of tax liability basis and the estimate has to be on a net tax liability basis that is clarified by the department through a circular net tax liability meaning that they are entitled to reduce any eligible or estimated itc that uh, they can think of for the period that they will be doing business as a casual uh, taxable person and pay the balance uh, when they apply for registration itself then they will have to apply for registration a minimum of 5 days before they commence business in the case of a regular taxable person they will have to do it 30 days uh, within 30 days of commencing the business here they will have to do it 5 days before they commence business itself then both categories of persons are not are not entitled for uh, the benefit of the composition scheme they will have to pay tax, tax under the regular provisions only and as i said the moment they do business beyond the maximum period of 180 days they will be treated as regular taxable persons and all applicable uh, provisions for a regular taxable person will be applicable to them also there is one major difference we saw all the common provisions there is one major difference uh, between both of them which is that in the case of a non resident taxable person he is not eligible for itc for any local purchases made by him it's only for any imports that he is eligible for itc now the most commonly cited example of both these category of person is people who conduct exhibitions that is a person who has a fixed place of business or who is registered in one state goes to another state to do an exhibition then he'll become a casual taxable person there provided of course that the exhibition doesn't cross the maximum registration period of 90 days which is extendable by 180 days now we will move on to a related concept since you may have noticed that in the definition of both the casual taxable person and non resident taxable person there is reference to the word fixed place of business so the fixed place of business is defined under the term fixed establishment in section 250 it is defined as having two basic ingredients one 
there must be a sufficient degree of permanence for the place of business that the person is going to uh, start, is going to use there must be a sufficient degree of permanence and two there must be a, suit, a suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources to supply uh, services and to receive services so these are the two basic ingredients that will constitute a fixed establishment now this definition is important for two purposes one to determine the location of a supplier or a recipient which are defined separate separately and there the concept of fixed establishment becomes relevant and the concepts of location of the supplier and recipient are in turn relevant for registration if we take one example uh, it was a case of a box contractor in gujarat in the case of jaimin engineering private limited who uh, was registered in gujarat but was undertaking a project in rajasthan and he applied for a clarification from the rajasthan advance ruling authority as to whether he needs to register in rajasthan so the advance ruling authority simply said that all depends on whether you have a fixed establishment in rajasthan so that will become the test when a works contractor uh, goes to another state and executes a project whether he needs registration or no will depends on whether he has a fixed establishment there so uh, base so we need to uh, see that the both the ingredients that we refer to sufficient degree of permanence and suitable structure of uh, human and technical resources they are a little vague they are uh, they are uh, you know uh, prone to interpretation therefore it is relevant to note that they are not from any of the legacy laws but they are taken directly from the eu vat regulations in eu uh, uh, the existence of a fixed establishment is very relevant for place of supply itself unlike under uh, the rgst act therefore uh, there is a lot of case law under the eu uh, uh vat regulation as to what constitutes a fixed establishment so when if the and this definition is borrowed directly from there so in future if there is any controversy regarding the scope of these terms we may have to look into the eu law next we will uh, look at two other categories of uh, taxable persons they are basically related person and distinct persons they are two different concepts defined under two different provisions but there is one similarity the similarity is that under schedule 2 both of them that is supply amongst themselves between two related persons and between two distinct persons is taxable irrespective of whether there is any consideration as long as it is in furtherance of the business so that is the similarity but the concept of a related person is relevant mostly in the context of valuation whereas distinct person uh, as we saw in earlier presentations is is relevant in the case in case of cross charge requirement registration etc first we look at the concept of a related person related person as i said is most relevant in the context of valuation and therefore is not uh, both these concepts another commonality we need to know not are not defined in chapter 1 the definition section of the they are defined under the relevant substantive provisions so the concept of a related person defined in section 15 being the substantive provision dealing with valuation so if you look at the definition it has seven self explanatory fact specific examples of what constitutes a related person we need to note that this definition is taken verbatim from rule 22 of the custom valuation rules and there, is, there was a similar concept under rule 44c of the central excise rules also but the central excise definition was a little wide it was not exhaustive unlike this therefore there was a whole body of case law as to what constitute a related person and the, the the basic crux of the case laws was that there must be mutuality of interest or identity of interest though that body of case law may not be directly relevant here because here we have an exhaustive list of seven definitions now i am not going to read each of those definitions except to note that at least in five of these seven sub categories the concept of control becomes relevant there is uh, if you see there is reference of the word control basically between one person over the other, uh, over the other through various uh, modalities and this word control is not defined under the gst act itself it is defined under uh, especially in the context of uh, or rather in the context of companies it is defined under section 227 of the companies act it is defined mostly in term majority shareholding and majority control in the board etc so if there is any scope or any scope for uh, confusion or controversy in future regarding the term control especially in the context of companies we may have to look at the jurisprudence under the companies act to resolve that controversy another uh, ingredient or feature of this definition is that a sole agent or a sole distributor or a sole concessionaire is deemed to be a related person irrespective of any other circumstance automatically deemed to be a related person now this is to get over a, a line of case law under the excise uh, regime 
that a sole agent or a sole distributor is not automatically a related person you still have to look into identity of interest now that is done away with and a sole agent basically a person who does agency or distributorship exclusively for one person for one customer is automatically deemed to be a related person now i should also mention here that uh, this concept of related person was uh, uh, when it when it, when it was introduced under the central excise regime was challenged uh, uh, for the virus itself was being challenged because basically it was a legal fiction that was introduced to discount a uh, valuation on the base of uh, uh, declared valuation in the transactions so uh, but the provision was upheld by the honorable supreme court in the case of union of india versus bombay tire international basically as a legal fiction that was introduced to protect revenue it was also justified as an extension of the principle of lifting of corporate veil in uh, company law jurisprudence and it was also held to be valid because it ensures valuation on an arms length basis now this is how Uh, this provision of related persons in the context of valuation was upheld another brief point that point that i'd like to mention in this context is that there is another related concept called associated enterprise which we are not going to go into detail except to note that there may be some overlap uh, in factual scenarios as well as in definition but that definition of associated enterprise which is provided under section 212 is is basically the same definition of the section 92a of the income tax act and is relevant under the gst act only to determine place of supply under section 133 again it is a concept an extension of the principle as to uh, to get over uh, transaction where there is no where there is no arms length uh, basis uh, for the as as it, for the transaction now as i said uh, uh, the uh, corollary concept is that of a distinct person now ironically though the term is distinct person legally it is actually the same person the same person when he applies for multiple registrations then he becomes a distinct person with respect to each of these registrations section 254 so as i said the definition of a distinct person is there under section 25 which is the substantive provision for registration it is not there under the definitions chapter so when one person holding a single pan card gets multiple registrations either in the same state or a different state then he has to then it the same person becomes a distinct person with respect to both these registrations or this multiple registrations so in the case of another state under section 252 he has to mandatorily register a, a person who is based in one state when he uh, commences a place of business in another state or commences business in another state he has to mandatorily register under 252 and under the law he is treated as a distinct person from the original entity or the original enterprise in the a first state the second category is where within the same state you may be required to obtain uh, another registration where you have another place of business now in for the second category it is the discretion of the department the section uses the word may the, 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 the department may give you another registration within the same state provided you fulfill the conditions under rule 11 there are three conditions under rule 11 one is the other place of business for which you are applying for registration within the same state has to fulfill the criteria for definition of the term of place of business under section 285 second that you must be willing to obtain this registration I and mean, you must be willing to opt out of any composition scheme out of the benefit of any composition scheme and third any inter unit supply between two distinct persons in the same state will be treated as a regular supply so subject to these criteria under rule 11 you may and you may get a registration as another place of business within the same state and both of you will be treated as distinct person uh, one additional provision that uh, you may notice is that under rule 40a 41a transfer of itc between distinct persons is allowed subject to uh, certain criteria I, we, are not, we are not going to go into the criteria except to notice that there is a provision that allows transfer of itc between distinct persons now we will come to the final definition which is also a very basic definition uh, it is the definition of a business which is provided under section 217 of the act now if you look at the definition it is very similar to the definition under all the legacy laws it has three major limbs a it must be any an activity must be any trade commerce manufacture etc etc whether or not it is for a pecuniary benefit so the idea seems to be to exclude profit motive and commercial motive now here i'd like to mention we'll just deal with it in a little detail also 
that the honorable supreme court in the context of religious institutions following a long line of case law starting from tirupati laddu uh, parani panjamritam etc had held in the case of sai publications 2002 acc that a religious institution no matter what activity it does can never be irrespective of the fact that the relevant definition in that case which was under the bombay sales tax act did not require a profit motive the definition of business under the bombay sales tax act did not require a profit motive still the shirdi sai baba trust was held not to be a business when it sells uh, calendars or diaries because it held that the main the supreme court held that the main object of the institution can never be trade commerce manufacture etc so the fact that the section does away with a pecuniary benefit or a commercial motive or a profit motive is not relevant because the main object of a temple or a religious institution itself is not business the second major limb of the definition is that any activity that is incidental or ancillary or in connection with the main clause that is we just saw clause a it lays down various categories of activities whether, irrespective of whether there is pecuniary benefit or not any activity that is, that is incidental or ancillary to this main activity is also treated as business now an example of what may or may not constitute the incidental or ancillary was the case of uh, of panacea biotech uh, 2012 decision of the delhi high court where a pharmaceutical manufacturing company was selling used cars cars that were bought for its employees were being sold by the company and the question arose as to whether the turnover from the sale of these used cars should be added to, uh, to the turnover of the company under the delhi vat act and whether this activity also constitutes business the delhi, delhi high court categorically held that no the uh, the activity of selling used cars by a pharmaceutical manufacturing company doesn't constitute business because the activity of selling cars is not related or ancillary to the main object the main clause a which is in that case manufacturing pharmaceuticals so it so in order to treat an ancillary activity as business you must look at what is the main activity of the company also of of the assc also the third limb of the definition is that it does away with any requirement for a minimum level of frequency regularity or volume for a business now this is done to get over the long list of case law under uh, the earlier taxation laws which held that a minimum level of frequency or regularity is mandatory uh, to constitute a business an example being uh, addition of the honorable supreme court in board of revenue was a m ansari where sale of uh, forest produce by the state government's forest department once a year was held not to be business because it was held to be not of sufficient regularity or frequency to constitute business now here under the de definition this requirement is specifically done away with any activity that fulfills the criteria under clause 1 and b will constitute business irrespective of its regularity or frequency now as we can see there are six other ingredients sublims of uh, the definition of business each of them are self explanatory and fact specific so we are not going to go into them in detail except to note that one of them is actually provision of services by a club or an association to its own members so here the controversy of mutuality comes into play i am just mentioning to note it and we are not going to go into it in detail the general definition the general ingredients are the first three the others are fact specific now as i said if you look into the controversies the major uh, uh, the the fact that the section does away with the requirement for pe pecuniary benefit may be relevant because the decision of the honorable supreme court in commissioner of sales tax was sai publication 2002 for scc 57 holding that the activity of shirdi sai baba trust in selling diaries and uh, calendars is not business was specifically held to be not applicable to the gst laws by the maharashtra aar in sri rajchand adhyatmik sadhana kendra even though even under the bombay sales tax act there was requirement for profit uh, motive so uh, without uh, discussing the provisions in detail the maharashtra aar simply holds that the that uh, dicta that religious institutions or charitable institutions do not come within the purview of gst automatically was held not to be applicable to gst law following that just last month the mara the karnataka aar held a lot of activities of a particular temple in karnataka to be uh, uh, amenable to uh, gst for instance uh, the activity of uh, giving out tenders for contractors to tonsure heads for tenders for parking lots etc were all held to be uh, liable to gst subject to the exemptions under the notifications 
uh, the relevant notifications. So the principle that religious or charitable institutions by their very nature will be outside the purview of uh, the definition of business has not been held to be applicable to GST by the advance ruling authorities. Another uh, interesting advance ruling was in the context of uh, a company that was providing insurance coverage for its employees. The company was a paint manufacturing company. It, this was the case of Indre Jordan, India Private Limited, a Maharashtra advance ruling, where a company that was manufacturing paints was providing insurance coverage for its employees. It came as to whether this activity uh, comes within the purview of business. And the Maharashtra AR clearly held that no, because you have to look at the main activity of the company, which is manufacturing paints. And the fact that it is providing insurance coverage or sponsoring insurance coverage for its employees may be incidental, but it is not incidental to the main activity, which is doing a manufacturing paints. And therefore, it doesn't come within the purview of business and is not taxable. Now, here we should also note that there is a slightly contrary uh, decision the Kerala AAR in the context of canteen services by uh, companies to employees. It was a case of Caltech systems where it was held canteen services by a company, which is an, an entirely different kind of business was held to be amenable to GST. But there, there is not much discussion regarding the scope of the term business. So uh, this is an area that may lead to disputes and litigation in future. Finally, I thought I'll just mention one clarification given by the uh, uh, department through a circular, CBIC through a circular, which was in response to a lot of queries from jewelers as to whether they will have to pay reverse charge, tax on reverse charge, GST on reverse charge for jewelry purchased from individuals. Now, the department clarified that uh, this doesn't have to be because uh, individuals, unregistered persons who are individuals selling jewelry is not their business. Therefore, uh, turnover from uh, purchase of uh, uh, jewels from individuals will not be amenable to GST because it doesn't come within the purview of business. And to constitute supply, it must be in furtherance of business. And since it is not the business of individuals to sell jewelry, jewelers will have to not, they need not pay GST on reverse charge. Now this by extension will also apply to cases where individuals sell used cars to car dealers and um, any such uh, you know, transactions will not be amenable to GST because individuals do not do business in these activities. With this, I end my presentation and I request Jayalakshmi to continue with her set of definitions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aditya. A very good evening to all of you. Um, I'm Jailakshmi P, Junior in BMG Associates, Office of Senior Counsel Shri N. Venkatraman. Um, I thank the Madras Tax Bar for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm just two years old in the tax uh, uh, arena, but thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. First slide, please. We'll be dealing with uh, six uh, select uh, definition in GST. The first one would be actionable claim. Actionable claim is uh, defined under section. One second, actionable claim is defined under section two one of the CGST Act. Uh, it says, actionable claim shall have the same meaning as assigned to it in Section 3 of the Transfer of Property Act, 1882. Now, this is a very thoughtful move by the government uh, to accommodate the evolving uh, statute. And Transfer of Property Act is the base act that deals with any kind of actionable claim. And therefore, it is very thoughtful that the GST drafts people have tried and incorporated the Transfer of Property Act definition in uh, GST. Schedule 3 talks about the Schedule 3 in item 6, where it lists the uh, supply, lists the item that neither deal with, uh, neither uh, are regarded as supply of goods or as supply of services. Very clearly in item 6 states that actionable claim other than lottery, betting and gambling shall be treated neither as a supply of goods nor a supply of service, which means it kind of collides these three into one box. Now, when we look at Section 3 of the Transit Property Act, uh, it provides actionable claim means a claim to any debt 
other than a debt secured by mortgage of immobile property or by hypothecation or pledge of mobile property or to any beneficial interest in mobile property not in the possession either actual or constructive of the claimant which the civil courts recognize as affording grounds for relief whether such debt or beneficial interest be existent accruing conditional or contingent basically actionable claim is any claim based on a promise that a court of law will take cognizance of so why a promise why are we talking only about unsecured debts because secured debts would be called interest in land where the creditor takes some asset some jewelry or some land and then gives me a loan based on the value of the asset or any uh, value of the security since there is already some kind of backup that he has it does not form part of actionable claim actionable claim is purely based on promise and the criteria is any beneficial interest in mobile property should not be in the possession of the claimant and civil courts should recognize as affording grounds for relief next slide please examples of uh, actionable claim are typically fixed deposit receipts profit share agreements and lottery tickets dividend shares insurance claims etc when we see the goods definition under cgst section 252 of the cgst act says good means every kind of mobile property other than money and securities but includes actionable claim so when schedule 3 very clearly says that actionable claim will form neither a, a supply of good nor a supply of service specifically section 252 says actionable claim as well and therefore when we read both of the uh, provisions together we understand that actionable claim relating to lottery betting and gambling alone would form part of goods under the gst and therefore would be taxable next slide please now this was a uh, actionable claim perspective was uh, decided by the calcutta high court in tista distributors versus union of india 2018 19 gstl 29 where it discussed about lotteries so the question was whether the west bengal government had the authority to uh, levy taxes on lottery so the court reading uh, section 252 along with uh, schedule 3 stated that lottery is very much fall within the ambit of the taxable uh, supply of goods and therefore definitely lotteries can be taxed under gst and the states have all the power to tax uh, under gst to tax lotteries under gst next in venkatasamy jagannathan uh, the aar in 2000 which is reported in 2019 27 gstl 32 stated profit sharing agreements will also form part of uh, will also form part of actionable claim and therefore they are not includable under the gst they are not taxable under gst next slide please in the case of gurdeep singh sachar versus union of india a very uh, unique problem came into existence where the tax rates for uh, gambling lottery and betting are 28% because they are considered luxury while for gaming it is only 18% so the question was in dream 11 fantasy online sport where it is this is more or less like a betting game where a real game will be a real uh, match would go on and based on that the uh, people who are participating in the dream 11 fantasy game will be playing so this is more or less it's, it's a mix of both gaming and gambling so the court said i quote success in dream 11's fantasy sport depends on users exercise of skill based on superior knowledge judgment and attention and the result thereof is not dependent on the winning or losing of a particular team in the real world and therefore they said this was definitely gaming because it it required sharp observation and knowledge of the sport itself and also of the online game and therefore this cannot be categorized as gambling and they let uh, the same be taxed under 18% slab the next definition we are going to cover today is aggregate turnover section 26 of the cgst act talks about aggregate turnover 
where it defines aggregate turnover means the aggregate value of all taxable supplies, excluding the value of invert supplies on which tax is payable by a person on reverse charge basis, exempt supplies, export of goods or services or both, and interstate supplies of persons having the same permanent account number to be computed on all India basis, but excludes central tax, state tax, union territory tax, integrated tax, and CES. Now when we're looking at the ingredients of aggregate turnover, it takes in aggregate value of all taxable supplies. However, excludes reverse charge liability. Why? Because when I'm expected to pay RCM, I will be the recipient. And therefore that supply would be a supply of some other person. And therefore that is not includable in my aggregate turnover. So now the ingredients, the basic ingredients will be aggregate value of all taxable supplies, excluding RCM, including uh, exempt supplies, export of goods or services or both, interstate supplies, uh, despite uh, same pan, and then the central tax or any other tax and cess would be out of the purview. Aggregate turnover is of predominant importance because it it is the yardstick under which the uh, threshold limit is computed and aggregate turnover is to be computed on all India basis. It's not state wise and uh, section 35.5 uh, talks about computing thresholds but only uses the term turnover. Even there it has to be interpreted with the aggregate turnover in perspective. So like aggregate turnover is great uh, for every industry. It's always after tax. In Anil Kumar Agarwal, uh, Advanced Ruling Authority of Karnataka, which is reported in 2025 TMI 221, stated that income received towards salary remunerations as non-executive director and then renting of commercial properties and renting of residential properties and values of interest from uh, deposits or loans or advance, uh, advances will also form part of aggregate turnover. And the income received from renting of residential property is to be included in aggregate turnover, though it's an exempt supply. Next slide, please. Now we are looking at, looking at turnover in state, which is almost an allied concept. Here, the computation is very similar, but aggregate turnover was pan-India. This is state-wise. The definition is stated in section 2.112. I quote, Turnover in state or union territory means the aggregate value of all taxable supplies excluding the value of inward supplies on which tax is payable by a person on reverse charge basis and exempt supplies made within a state or union territory by a taxable person, export of goods or services or both, and interstate supplies of goods or services or both made from the state or union territory by the set taxable person but excludes central tax, state tax, Union Territory Tax, Integrated Tax, and CES. Now the ingredients are very similar. It in, uh, includes, the kinds of supply it includes are taxable supply, exempt supply, supplies that have a nil rate uh, of tax, supplies that are wholly exempt from CGST, SGST, UDGST, IGST, or CES, and supplies that are not taxable under the uh, Act, like alcoholic liquor for human consumption, and articles listed in Section 9.2 and uh, Schedule 3. Export of goods or services or both, including a zero rated supplies are also included. It specifically excludes RCM supplies and uh, taxes. As in, when I'm the recipient of an RCM supply, that is excluded. The relevance is uh, state or union territory wise computation uh, is based on the uh, aggregate, uh, I mean, based on the turnover in state or union, ter union territory. Calculation of composition levy is uh, based on that. Next slide, please. When we're talking about composition levy, composition levy is uh, for taxpayers who fall below the uh, uh, our small time uh, uh, GST registered persons. So they can opt to pay uh, a tax as one time at, without ITC. This composition threshold limit is calculated using aggregate supply as the criteria. However, for computing the levy, turnover in state or turnover in union territory is used. So, uh, some perspective on computing and balancing skills. 
Next slide, please. Yes. Section 213 deals with audit. Audit, though a very basic definition, this is very important in order to understand the nitty gritties of GST. Section 213 defines audit where it states, audit means the examination of reports, returns and other documents maintained or furnished by the registered person under this act or the rules made thereunder or under any other law for the time being enforced to verify the correctness of turnover declared, taxes paid, refund claimed and input tax credit availed and to assess his compliance with the provisions of this act or the rules made thereunder. Now, when we see the ingredients of audit, audit is based on examination of records. But what records? Uh, an SSE cannot hold different records for different uh, laws, statutory compliances. Say, for example, the SSE cannot have one record for GST, one record for income tax, and one record for insurance claim, and cannot say that the auditor cannot uh, audit all the records. He cannot say, sir, sir, this is the GST uh, record, therefore you can audit this alone. Auditor statutorily has the right to uh, audit or uh, examine all the records that are maintained by the SSE. And why is he auditing? He's uh, examining to verify the correctness of turnover declared under GST, to see if all the taxes have been paid, to see if the refunds have been claimed uh, correctly, and to see if the input tax credits are in line, and also to assess his compliance to the statute overall. Now there are three types of audit. One is statutory audit where uh, SSEs or registered persons going above the threshold limit of two crores are expected to appoint a chartered accountant or a cost management account accountant in order to audit the books of accounts and these reconciliation statements and balance sheets along with any other predominant in important documents that have been found in the audit have to be submitted before the uh, assessment authority. Now the other extreme is normal or departmental audit. Departmental audit has uh, no threshold limit, so to say. Any registered person under uh, the GST, the department can choose to audit. When the department finds that the returns are not in uh, record or the returns have not been filed or uh, it opines that there is some uh, mismatch in their accounts, the department can audit. And special audit is where, again, there's a threshold for special audit. Special audit is where the department feels that there is some issue and the SSE falls above the threshold limit of two crores, the department can appoint an expert like a chartered accountant or a cost management accountant to audit the, uh, the specified case because it's a very complex uh, issue. So special audit is in cases where the department opines that the issue is so complex that an expert has to come and view the books of accounts of the SSE. Here, the only difference is in a statutory audit, the CAs or CMAs are appointed by the SSE themselves, while in special audit, it is the department that uh, appoints the chartered accountants or the cost management accountants. And why uh, this department audit? Because uh, in case of Mega Cabs Private Limited versus Union of India, there was a very interesting issue where the SSE challenged um, the departmental audit saying, under the uh, legacy laws, it was department only had the right to view the records and not audit per se. So assessment under service tax, self-assessment, the, the claim of the SSE was there is no provision of uh, reassessment of self-assessment of service tax under Finance Act. However, in circumstances with non-filing of returns and non-payment of service tax, there is provision under which only designated assessing officer can call for records of SSE under section 72 of the Finance Act. So the court held that only records can be called for, but the authorities have no right to audit. Uh, so this, in this case, the appeal is pending before Supreme Court. So uh, I think in order to circumvent this uh, issue, the statute itself provides for uh, uh, departmental audit. Next slide, please. So under GST, this is the kind of uh, season greetings and uh, well wishes we get from the department. We are one in a million. <laughs> so the types of audit, uh, statutory audit is uh, dealt under section 35.5. Uh, normal departmental audit is um, 
dealt with in section 65, where it says there should be uh, 15 days of advance intimation if uh, the department chooses to audit me. And then the duration should be th three months to the maximum it can go on for a further six months if the uh, commissioner feels that the matter is a little complicated. And then the findings have to be communicated to me with reasons within 30 days of completion of the uh, audit. Next slide, please. In special audit, again, it gives, it says any um, officer above the uh, assistant commissioner, assistant commissioner or above with the accept, uh, with the uh, go ahead from the commissioner can appoint a chartered accountant or a cost management accountant in order to uh, audit the uh, records of a particular assessment. Next slide, please. When this is the kind of assessment that the department faces uh, or receives, Audit is paramount in uh, CGS or any taxable salary for the matter. Uh, section 219 talks about capital goods. Capital goods means goods, the value of which is capitalized in the books of accounts of the persons claiming input tax credit and which are under or which are used or intended to be used in the course of furtherance of business. Looking at the ingredients of capital goods, number one, these goods have to be capitalized by the SSE in the books of accounts, wherein the SSE opines that these are going to form part of uh, the base with which I'm going to produce or I'm going to do any service. And these have, can be used or they can even be intended to be used. Uh, and then one key feature of capital good is that these are not consumed. These, for example, an input would be consumed in a stage of production or in the rendering of service. And uh, when the final product emerges, the uh, input would not be there. However, capital good will merely undergo maximum some wear and tear or some depreciation. So in common parlance, uh, machines are capital goods. For a banker, a locker is a capital good. Or for, for a cinematographer, camera is a capital good, etc. But this capital goods definition has a very beautiful and elaborate history. In 1986, Modbat was brought in for inputs. And uh, in 1994, the government took a very bold decision to uh, bring in capital goods under the Modbat credit scheme. In fact, in those days, capital goods, uh, tax paid on capital goods were contributing maximum to the exchequer. But this was a very, very bold move in order to, uh, you know, in order to boost globalization, uh, industrial revolution was happening. So in order to give a boost to people who really wanted to uh, start industries, capital goods were uh, given uh, credit. So for the first time in uh, the taxing statute, the definition of capital goods were defined under rule 57Q. Uh, explanation one said capital goods means and it included almost every possible uh, machinery, plant equipment, apparatus. And it said the, the basic factor was bringing about any change in any substance. So that was the baseline with which they assessed if something was a capital good. And they also included components, spare parts, accessories, and kind of uh, broadened the definition even to molds or dyes and any kind of generating sets or wave bridges, etc. All of it had to be used in the factory. So that was the qualifying limit. So between 1994 to 96, it was the broadest definition of capital goods. And in, in, in Jawahar Mill's case, the Supreme Court also said even wires and cables would qualify as capital goods. Later, there was an amendment to the definition by notification 14 of 96C, where the department brought in a few chapter headings and stated any, I quote, in the said rules in Rule 57Q1, in Subrule 1, from the explanation, the following explanation shall be substituted, namely, explanation for the purpose of this section, capital goods means following goods falling within the schedule to the Central Excise Tariff Act 1985 and used in factory of the manufacturer. And they stated, chapter headings like chapter 84, chapter 85, and they said chapter 90, 11 to 13, 90, 16, 90, 17, 90, 22, and so on. And then after D, after ABC uh, listing the chapter headings, 
from D to H, they clearly gave components, spare parts, etc., molds and dyes, and uh, refractors and pollution uh, control equipment, etc. So when we brought this, the department interpreted it, or the assessing officers interpreted it in tune with the classification, uh, classific uh, classification subheadings that were from A to C. So then, department issued a clarificatory circular uh, in 1996, December, 276 of 96, clarifying that it states, accordingly, it is clarified that all parts, components, accessories, which are to be used in capital goods of clauses A to C of explanation one of rule 57Q and classifiable under any chapter heading are eligible for availment of mod back credit. So this widened the spectrum so much that later the courts generously allowed mod back credit for even supporting structures and all possible components uh, and spare parts that were used inside the industry. The definition of capital goods under GST is also very expansive. Next slide please. Now, when we look at ITC on capital goods, here again, there are two extremes and one middle ground. If I use the capital good purely for personal or exempted use, then I get no ITC. But if I use it for normal taxable sale, including zero rated supply, ITC is eligible in full. However, if there is part usage, part for personal use or exempted use and part for normal use, then proportional ITC has, be, has to be calculated and ITC available for normal or taxable sale would be available for me. Next slide, please. So pre-GST, uh, we see that quite a lot of definitions have undergone this kind of uh, uh, upgradation and uh, this kind of beautification at every stage, which, which gave it more clarity and which made it um, predominantly more SSC friendly. But post GST, the definitions are, li are a little clear, uh, crystallized, and I feel uh, definitions are way more simpler under GST. Next slide, please. The last definition for the manufacture. For looking at the manufacture definition under GST, it's, it's paramount to see the history, the threshold of knowledge from where the present manufacture definition has been uh, beautifully coined. Manufacture definition under uh, the Central Excise and Salt Act, Section 2F, defined manufacture includes any process incidental or ancillary to the completion of a manufactured product and which is specified in relation to any goods in section or chapter notes of the first schedule to the Central Excise Tariff Act as amounting to manufacture, deemed manufacture was also included, and then three, which is relating to goods specified in third schedule of SETA involves and repacking of such goods in a unit container or labeling and relabeling. So anything that formed under the third schedule, even packing and repacking was said to, said to be deemed manufacture. Next slide, please. So Delhi Cloth and Mills, uh, in the case of Delhi Cloth and Mills, uh, Supreme Court had to decide if processing would also mean, mean manufacture. It, it went through quite a lot of uh, judgments, uh, statutes throughout the globe, uh, looked into American decisions at length, looked into dictionary meanings uh, throughout the world, and stated, I quote, the word manufacture used as a verb is generally understood to mean as bringing into existence a new substance and does not mean merely to produce some change in a substance, however minor or consequence the change may be. And quoting permanent edition of words phrase from an American judgment, the court held, manufacture implies a change, but every change is not manufacture, and yet every change of an article is to be the result of treatment, labor, and manipulation. But something more is necessary, and there must be transformation a new and different article must emerge having a distinctive name character and use this was further uh, dealt with and uh, further crystallized by empire industries case uh, supreme court again in 18 uh, almost eight years later in 1985 stated 
transformation of an object into a different commercial commodity sufficient to constitute was sufficient to constitute manufacture so therefore this was the first time when transformation was brought in into the spectrum of manufacture and said there must be some transformation some genesis of a new identity then uh, in the madras high court ruling in breaks india limited uh, was the superintendent of central excise madras it was a madras high court ruling which was later affirmed by the supreme court in 1998 the court stated that any process if it is incidental and ancillary to the completion of manufacturing product it will certainly amount to manufacture and supreme court held that yes the decision was entirely right because anything falling part of incidental and ancillary was anyway a manufacture under the definition itself next slide please then came this jewel the jk glass industries case where in 1998 the supreme court kind of gave a full proof mechanism to determine what is manufacture so here the court said gave a two fold test number one the identity of the original commodity must cease to exist for example if i'm using something as a raw material and i'm manufacturing some some new product once the new product comes into comes into existence i should not be able to identify or uh, look at the product as the raw material itself the identity must be erased completely the second is where the commodity was already in existence will serve no purpose so once a new product has come with improved superior uh, consumption effect the old product should serve no uh, no use at all so having these two fold test kind of crystallized the definition of a manufacture and it became so much easier for the courts in later stage to uh, examine uh, and decide if any process or any contribution by the uh, ssc was a manufacture at all now when we come to the definition of manufacture under the gst gst defines manufacture in a very simple way manufacture means processing of raw material or inputs in any manner that results in emergence of a new product having a distinct name character and use and the term manufacture shall be construed accordingly here very simple after i i feel after uh, after reading this definition and after uh, you know researching on the uh, genesis and the legacy it is very clear that gst definitions have not been brought about just like that or just for the sake of it in fact manufacture is a term that's not uh, that's not a taxable event per se under gst uh, erstwhile uh, uh, you know tax law manufacture was a very important one of the very important taxable events but in gst it's not a definition that's of primordial importance but still thought has been put uh, you know the the framers have taken so much efforts to make it as simple as possible in order to uh, you know cut short as many uh, litigation or confusions as possible so it only states this processing of raw material or inputs it has to result in a new product taking in transformation from the uh, empire states uh, case it says there must be transformation there must be new product new genesis with distinct name character and use and this is taken from the uh, dictionary meaning in the delhi uh, general uh, cloth and mills case so it's very beautiful how uh, aspects from here and there have been beautifully garlanded and brought into a definition so the key factors with which the courts are looking into manufacture today is there must be transformation and there must be genesis of a new entity having a completely distinct name completely distinct character and use which is marketably known to everybody um one of the um, uh, major cases the dealt by aar in uh, manufacture was jsw energy limited under the gst regime and the main question was whether job work was a manufacture here again i mean the ba basic uh, issue was here jsl had supplied some coal to jel and jel was to produce some electricity from that coal so they termed it only as a job work but the court uh, the aar held that because there was a genesis of a new product called electricity that comes into existence after this conversion of coal to electricity and therefore that indeed though uh, that did satisfy to an extent the uh, it was just a job work according to the uh, assc but that did satisfy the condition of manufacture and therefore that has to be defined as manufacture next slide please 
So GST, from my understanding, is not only trying to integrate all the states as one tax law to you know completely bring India together, but it also is aiming at putting the statute of India, the tax statute of India at world level, where most of the definitions have been very well researched, taken from international law, and definition of not only manufacture, but a lot of definitions under GST is in line with the definitions throughout the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jay Lakshmi. Thank you, uh, Muthu, Muthu sir and Aditya Reddy sir. Uh, so now the floor is open for question answers. I'll enable the chat options. Or you can raise your hands in the app. Uh, we can actually stop sharing the screen now so that uh, the question on the session will be more interactive. I'll unmute Aparna ma'am first. Yes, uh, Muthu, Jay Lakshmi, and Aditya. Wonderful presentations, fantastic diction, and uh, very, very, very well planned. Fantastic. Keep it up. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there were a few questions which I sent to uh, Mutusa. Uh, Mutusa, did you read those questions? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay, uh, I will again resend it to you. Okay. okay. Just read out one or two questions from that. Yeah, uh, Lakshmi and Aditya, can you uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yes. I can hear. Okay. But I think but the I questions are sent to you. Personally. 